Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 10, Municipalist In 1980 Bookchin's friend and translator Carl Ludwig Skibble organized a speaking tour of West Germany for him in January 1980, and when he set out, his hopes for the political scene there may not have been high. But as he moved through Frankfurt, Kassel, Hanover, and West Berlin, he found it to be buzzing with action and hope. In Europe the post-war baby boom had begun somewhat later than in the United States, and now as American youth had done ten years earlier, many European young people were rejecting consumerism and power politics, militarism and the patriarchal family racism, and environmental destruction, and were seeking to form a communal, cooperative, non-hierarchical culture as an alternative. Throughout the 1970s, citizens action groups in West Germany had been organizing around issues of the environment, gender equity, minority rights, housing, social services, and public transportation. After the successful site occupation at Will in 1975, opposition to nuclear power had spread. We weren't just trying to do symbolic actions, recalled the socialist journalist and activist Yoda did Firth. We were trying to actually block the construction of the plant. Now in Frankfurt a culture of political protest was emerging. The international airport was planning to build a new runway extension through an old growth forest, and activists were opposing it. The chemical conglomerates Hooks and Merck had buried toxic waste near city water supplies and dumped pollutants straight into the Main and Rhine rivers, so demonstrators took to the streets. Faced with a housing shortage, students and youth squatted abandoned houses communally and fought off police attempts to evict them. Frankfurt bookstores like the Karl Marx Bookshop, spilled over with volumes of radical theory and analysis, including book chins, which had been published in German translation since 1974-75. In Germany it seemed, Bookchin need not live on the dark side of the moon after all. In December 1979, NATO had announced that it intended to station more than 200 Pershing II and cruise missiles on West German soil, nuclear-capable missiles able to reach Moscow in minutes. If a nuclear war broke out between the United States and the Soviet Union, West Germany would be the battlefield, yet these terrifying weapons would be outside any effective democratic control. Instantly a concentrated peace movement sprang to life. But no one was trying to tell this movement to concentrate on nuclear weapons alone, Bookchin realized, the way the clamshell reps had tried to tell him to concentrate on nuclear energy alone. On the contrary these young Germans understood that nuclear weapons were merely a symptom of a dysfunctional society. They were creating the kind of broad, multi-issue, anti-hierarchical movement that he had hoped that Clamshell and NEAC could generate linking issues of ecology feminism, energy, and peace. Their movement, moreover, was decentralized, emphasizing grassroots democracy in structure and direct action in practice. And finally German youth seemed to have a greater appreciation for social theory than did pragmatic Americans, which made their movement all the more impressive. To them it was axiomatic that ecological problems stemmed from social problems, hence their movement was tantalizingly social-ecological. It was close to what Bookchin had been looking for in the United States. Perhaps he could mediate a cross-cultural interchange, he thought, combining German theoretical rigor with the American libertarian impulse. Due to his teaching commitments at Ramapo, Bookchin could not linger in Europe. But in the spring of 1981, when he had a sabbatical, he returned and spent several weeks traveling through West Germany Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Italy once again soaking up the radical scene. Squats were important nodes around which this European youth movement was forming, and the squatters movement, a loose network of communes, had evolved into a struggle for free, alternative spaces generally. In Freiburg and Zurich, Squatters had formed autonomous youth centers that were basically anarchistic in character. At weekly meetings at the Zurich Youth Center, the microphone was open and people could just walk up and say whatever they want to say, without a moderator, yet the meetings were functional. The Circle Day, a symbol of anarchism, was ubiquitous. 
Impressed, he told the communal squatters about the America libertarian tradition that was grounded communally in town meetings, dating back to the revolution. Strikingly, this admirable youth movement was based not in large urban centers but in small cities like Freiburg and Nuremberg. Such cities, he realized, still had some sense of community, one could be politically creative there, in a way that one could not in big cities like New York or Frankfurt. This robust European scene helped him realize that living in small-scale Vermont didn't have to mean giving up political life or being sidelined to margins, the margins could have an unexpected importance as the birthplace of the rich variety of forms, sensibilities, and institutions that are likely to supplant and transcend the given centers of today. Living far from an urban core, 40 miles from the Canadian border, could thus actually be an advantage, opening up new possibilities for action. His grandmother's idol, after all, had chosen to live on the margins, in the borderlands of the Russian Empire, and had found a way to be politically creative there. He returned to the United States to his teaching job at Ramapo, but he moved his primary residence to Burlington, where the political possibilities beckoned. The commute was grueling, during the school year he would drive the 266 miles to Ramapo, check into a motel, teach his classes, then drive back to Burlington. But Vermont, with its political culture that emphasized civic participation and community was worth it. Each of its 242 towns had a town meeting, which assembled on the first Tuesday in March every year. The Vermont town meeting, he thought, bore a striking resemblance to the Ecclesia, the citizens' assembly of the ancient Athens. Vermont towns were small in scale like the Athenian polis, small enough to be taken in at a single view, as Aristotle had prescribed. The Vermont citizens who governed themselves through the town meetings were, like ancient Athenians, amateurs at politics who met face to face and made decisions about the shared, communal elements of their lives. They too were a demos, people, who enjoyed philia, solidarity, and koinonia, community life. They shared, in Book Chin's eyes, a reverence for arate, virtue, and dyke, justice. Their political experience taught them polytyke techni, political judgment. And on certain matters, like local infrastructure and schools and budget, they enjoyed autonomia, self-rule, or independence from the state, possessing direct, unmediated control of society. Ancient Greek political thought, imbued with such ethical concepts, was closely tied, he saw, to a nature philosophy that emphasized that the cosmos, natural world, had an orderly structure that was comprehensible by nous, mind, or logos, reason. A nature philosophy based on these ideas could guide us toward a deeper sense of ecological insight into our warped relationship with the natural world, he thought, and would be far more relevant to Western ecology movements than Asian philosophy. Particularly in the work of the pre-Socratic philosophers, he found a sense of reality that was not only orderly and comprehensible but pregnant, fecund, and imminently self-elaborating. The Marxists had trained Murray to think dialectically, in terms of unfolding and emergence. As he studied Aristotle's concepts of dunamis, potentiality, and entelechia, actuality, the fulfillment of potentiality, he recognized in them the roots of his familiar philosophy. His very cast of mind was dialectical, the source of his optimism was his ability to recognize potentialities for freedom and progress in both present and past. Human beings had the dunamis to create an eco-decentralist society governed by assembly democracy as its entelechia. Hayes recalled that, while carpooling with him to Ramapo, Book Chin took you out of today's newspaper, and you entered a world of human potential that could be actualized and recovered. His attitude was, hey this is real, it happened, it can happen again. To begin to fulfill Burlington's potentialities, Book Chin brought together a small group of anarchists to work with, individuals who were educated in social ecology and committed to putting it into practice. He found them in clamshell veteran Brian Toker, anti-nuclear activist Alan Kurtz, social ecology student David Block, and others who followed him to Burlington. Their study group read Bookchin's by now standard texts, 
Buber's Paths in Utopia and Horkheimer's Eclipse of Reason and Dialectic of Enlightenment, as well as current work in evolutionary theory and nature philosophy. At the same time they would get involved in local politics. Burlington's mayor, Gordon Paquette, was intent on developing the city's waterfront. Through various quirks of history, the land on the shore of Lake Champlain had been reduced to an industrial dumping ground, home to oil storage tanks, an old grain mill, and warehouses, as well as debris and weeds and broken bottles. What Charis might have done with it? In its 19th century heyday, it had been a busy port, transshipping trees felled in Canada onto rail cars. But that industry had vanished almost a century earlier, whereupon the waterfront, owned by the Central Vermont Railway, had fallen into disuse. In 1971 Burlington City Council, then called the Board of Aldermen, formed a committee to decide what to do with the waterfront, which led to studies, development proposals, financing schemes, and zoning changes. Most recently local developer Antonio Pomerlo had proposed to construct a high-rise luxury enclave at the water's edge, with three condo towers, as well as a marina, a 150-room hotel, restaurants and offices, a parking lot, and some shops. Mayor Paquet, catering to the local business establishment, was solidly behind the $35 million project. But many city residents demurred, Palmer Lowe's luxurious plan would create an enclave for the wealthy, at a time when the city lacked adequate housing for working people. A neighborhood movement sprang to life, in part to oppose it, and the battle would be joined in the next mayoral election. Mayor Paquet would face the voters in March 1981. A 39-year-old writer, filmmaker, and socialist activist, Bernard Sanders, stepped forward to challenge him, running as the voice of the neighborhoods. Sanders opposed the Palmer Low plan and pledged, if elected, to establish an alternative waterfront development policy, one which will bring jobs and prosperity for all of Burlington rather than a few wealthy individuals. Campaigning on the slogan Burlington is not for sale Sanders slogged door-to-door -door through five-foot-high snowdrifts. On March 4, 1981, Burlington elected him mayor, by a margin of 10 votes out of more than 9,600 cast. 10 anarchist votes. Murray would say. And I know who they were. While Burlington's political establishment reeled at the prospect of a socialist mayor in the Georgian-style city hall, the neighborhood groups rejoiced. Book Chin commended the socialist awakening in the city's political culture, the Vermont citizenry seems to have risen up with a political vitality that we have not seen for years. The city's neighborhood movement was planning a conference to transform itself into a cohesive political force. In advance of the conference, neighborhood groups were invited to submit resolutions on a whole spectrum of social and environmental issues. Book Chin's anarchist friends, under his tutelage, submitted three resolutions. Waterfront and Downtown Development argued that the waterfront should be held in a public trust and developed in accordance with Burlingtonians' desires. Energy and the Environment urged the city to make more use of renewable energy. The third resolution, on neighborhood democracy was the most remarkable. It proposed replacing the existing city council with a system of open democratic neighborhood assemblies. Each of the city's six wards would form an assembly to hold their respective city councillors accountable through mandate rotation, and recall. If a councillor refused to submit to such accountability the assembly would run its own candidate in the next election. When a sufficient number of the Alder People city councillors represent the neighbourhood assemblies, the city charter should be revised so that the board council is officially composed of mandated, recallable representatives of the neighbourhood assemblies. The council's function would then be merely to coordinate the assemblies, which would constitute a neighborhood government. On May 16, 1981, the Conference of Neighborhoods endorsed these and 30-odd more resolutions. Burlington had gained not only a socialist mayor but a dynamic popular movement. Since Book Chin had become a teacher in 1973, his book on hierarchy had languished in a state of incompletion. In the spring of 1981, after he came home from Europe, he used the rest of his sabbatical time to finish it. 
when it was complete he gave the manuscript to his friend Michael Ryarden to publish at the small press he had founded called Cheshire Books. The Ecology of Freedom was Bookchin's fullest exposition of radical social ecology using material drawn from history, anthropology, dialectical philosophy, and science. The first chapters, as we have seen, described an original organic society with a mutualistic, egalitarian social organization, then went on to trace the rise of hierarchies, gerontocracy warriors, patriarchy. Domination was the next phase with states, tyrannies, inquisitions, empires. The 18th century enlightenment had made the domination of nature part of the civilizatory enterprise, humanity if it were to progress, must subdue and conquer nature. Fortunately, the West also has a long-standing anti-hierarchical tradition, dating from uprisings in the ancient world to medieval heretics and peasant revolts to the democratic revolutions of England, the United States, and France, to the Paris Commune to the Spanish Revolution. The common, if unspoken, dream of all these movements was to revive the principles of organic society, usufruct, the irreducible minimum, and the principle of complementarity, but within the framework of modernity. The liberation of humans from exploitation and domination, Bookchin argued, is a precondition for creating a society in harmony with nature. Only a free, emancipated society could create an ecologically sound planet. A social ecology movement would advance a moral economy as an alternative to capitalism, replacing competition with values of reciprocity and interdependence, of responsibility and integrity. It must seek to construct a cooperative economic life, producing not for profit but for excellence and for the sake of the community. In Ecology of Freedom, supplemented by a series of articles in the early 1980s on nature philosophy and ethics, Bookchin rejected the dualistic idea, derived from Descartes, of a radical dichotomy between humans and the rest of nature and embraced instead the idea of a graded continuum, stretching from the simplest life forms to human society as described by evolutionary theory. Human beings, like all other organisms, are an integral part of that continuum. Natural evolution, what Bookchin called first nature, has also given rise to human society, second nature, and people necessarily inhabit that social environment as well as that biological one. With our symbolic faculties and our capacity for cooperation, Homo sapiens is uniquely social as well as natural, our behavior is conditioned not only by biology but also by society language, psychology, and culture. Part of our dual nature is creative agency. Through our labor and our imagination, we are structured to interact with non-human nature, even to modify and transform it. This distinctiveness, however, does not give us the right to subordinate the rest of nature or to wield dominion over the earth. Least of all does it give us the right to treat it as an assemblage of resources available for our use. Capitalism, with its market economy geared to producing goods for profit rather than need, views it this way, but that system is social not biological, a part of our second nature, culture, not first nature, our physiological makeup, and hence alterable. We are capable of changing that system and replacing it with a different system, one that relates to the rest of nature with respect and intelligence. And we can orient our use of science and technology toward humane and life-affirming purposes, rather than toward the enhancement of profit and environmental destruction. Removing ourselves from the ideologies of domination and submission, we can cultivate an ecological sensibility, respect for natural phenomena, sensitivity to the interdependence of life forms, and a feeling of responsibility for the natural world. In so doing, we can potentially even improve on it, promoting the flourishing of people as well as the biosphere. That sensibility must be underpinned by an ethics. In order to have substance, Bookchin believed, ethics must be grounded in tangible reality. What was to be the ground for an anti-capitalist ethics? Moral relativism, with its fleeting, changeable values, offered none. Nor could religion, with its tablets of commandments, provide an ethical foundation, such authoritarian systems, demanding of their adherents unquestioning obedience to thou shalt not injunctions, had no place in a modern, 
rational movement. Not even the Frankfurt School had a good answer, in Bookchin's view. Its members thought instrumental rationality had reduced ethics to the utilitarian calculation of risks versus benefits, of greater evils versus lesser ones. But the rejection of rationality opened the door to the demonic. Horkheimer and Adorno were, Bookchin found, unable to anchor an emancipatory ethics in nature philosophy and ended with a dark pessimism about the human condition. As always, while he admired their analysis, he couldn't accept their pessimism. The objective basis for ethics, he concluded, lay in nature itself. By that he did not mean simplistic parallels between natural and social phenomena, say, by reductively explaining human behavior in terms of biology, especially genes, rather than by considering the social factors at work. Historically the privileged and powerful had tried to justify hierarchy, oligarchy, slavery, sexism, imperialism, and the state, and had dominated women, people of color, and colonized ethnic groups and nationalities by asserting that they were naturally inferior based on their biology. Social Darwinism had tried to justify capitalism by maintaining that since competition exists in nature, survival of the fittest, competition, rather than cooperation, must exist in society. No, if nature were to be a ground for ethics, it would have to be understood not in terms of parallels but for its ontology, fecund and creative, ever-changing, evolving toward greater complexity dialectical. Life forms are not only competitive but cooperative, and their mutual cooperation and symbiosis have helped advance natural evolution at least as much as competition, if not more. According to the evolutionary biologist William Traeger, mutual cooperation between different kinds of organisms, symbiosis, is just as important as competition, and, the fittest may be the one that most helps another to survive. Cellular life itself may have begun with a symbiotic cooperation between viruses and bacteria, as the biologist Lynn Margulis showed. But to assert that we must have a cooperative society because cooperation exists in nature would itself be a kind of reductionism, we must avoid projections of our own social relationships into the natural world, Bookchin observed, even cooperative ones. Nature is neither cruel nor kind, it has no morality, nature is a ground for ethics, but is not ethical as such. Rather, Bookchin argued instead that mutuality cooperation, and complementarity are potentialities in the natural world, ones that have historically been expressed and, one hopes, will continue to be. As a result of their expression, natural evolution has had a cumulative history of increasing complexity and diversity toward ever more elaborate and conscious life forms. Over eons, along that graded evolutionary continuum, creatures' neural and sensory systems became more differentiated, resulting in consciousness and culminating in the layered human brain. Tantalizingly, the paleontologist Elizabeth Verba's effect hypothesis suggested that evolution includes an imminent striving, or directionality. That implied, Bookchin thought, that evolution could be self-directive, even participatory. He denied that this notion amounted to teleology, asserting that the directional process is neither inexorable nor preordained. Potentialities do not inexorably achieve actualization. Potentiality is not necessity, no specific stage of a process necessarily yields a later one. But as natural history shows, more neurologically complex organisms did evolve, and so did their capacity to make choices, and so did the possibility of freedom. As the 20th century German philosopher Hans Jonas pointed out, even the most rudimentary organism, the cell, makes an effort to preserve itself, to maintain its identity, through metabolism, and cellular metabolism is evidence of germinal freedom. Human beings have the potentiality for both freedom and self-consciousness, not by analogy to natural evolution, not as a projection onto it, but by virtue of being a continuation of natural evolution. Selfhood and reason and consciousness are products of natural evolution, in this respect, evolutionary biology accorded with dialectical philosophy with Hegelian ideas of potentiality and actualization, the history of the world, Hegel had said, 
is none other than the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Reinterpreted in terms of natural evolution, natural evolution seemed to book Chin to constitute a dynamic nature philosophy. And it also constituted the basis of an ecological ethics. The evolution of nervous systems and consciousness, of choice, and freedom, are what Book Chin meant, in my opinion, when he said nature is a ground for ethics. His ethical ought is grounded in the objective reality of potentialities for freedom and consciousness. The purpose of an ecological ethics, he said, was to help us distinguish which of our actions serve the thrust of natural evolution and which of them impede it. Human beings have the objective potential to bring natural evolution to a new level of freedom and consciousness, they are objectively capable of actualizing the potentiality of natural evolution to produce a rational, ethical, cooperative ecological society, which Book Chin named in advance third or free nature, although they may or may not actually do so. The German idealist philosopher Johann Fichte had remarked that humans are a nature rendered self conscious. Book Chin agreed only by adding the qualifier potentially. The Ecology of Freedom, as well as the philosophical essays that followed its publication, was dense and erudite, rich and sweeping, both polemical and speculative. It navigated multiple disciplines, connected them in original ways, and tied them all to concrete social praxis. As the pages emerged from his selectric typewriter, he shared them with the Burlington anarchists. We would sit in groups and read it out loud, Toker recalled. It was fantastic. His friends understood that it was a milestone in the history of anarchism. John Ely commended it as anarchism's first comprehensive and cohesive theory, while John Clark called it the first elaborated and theoretically sophisticated anarchist position. Book Chin finished the manuscript in October 1981, and upon its publication a few months later, some reviewers pointed to shortcomings, anthropologist Karen Field, for one, thought it selectively painted an overly homogenized, even sanitized, picture of preliterate peacefulness and egalitarianism. Nonetheless she lauded the book as the kind of wide-ranging and impassioned synthesis that is all too rare in this age of scholarly specialization and a graceful model of what scientific synthesis can be. Most reviewers accorded it high praise. John Fakit noted that it urged a cosmic evolutionary ethic that was favorable to the survival and life interest of the human race, and authentically grounded in the potentialities and actualizations of nature. He commended Book Chin for integrating ethical philosophy with natural evolution, even to have raised an agenda this complicated and significant testifies to the courage, dedication, and intelligence of the author. Theodore Roshik called it perhaps the most important contribution to environmental thought we will see in our generation. With it, Book Chin takes his place with Thoreau, Lewis Mumford, and Paul Goodman as a major American political philosopher. Stanley Uranowitz placed Book Chin at the pinnacle of the genre of utopian social criticism, the successor to the many generations of diggers, levelers, and ranters. Science writer Robin Clark remarked, Book Chin's relationship to Marx can be paralleled with that of Albert Einstein to Isaac Newton. In 1980-81, as Book Chin was finishing the manuscript, the movement against nuclear weapons was growing. NATO, as we have seen, had announced its intention to deploy Euro missiles in Central Europe, and now President Reagan was signaling a willingness to fight a tactical and limited nuclear war, to actually use the heinous weapons. To many Americans and Europeans, nuclear war seemed not only possible but imminent. Carl Hess was one. Living off the grid in West Virginia, he started a newsletter called Survival Tomorrow and invited Book Chin to participate. Paging through an issue, Murray found articles advising libertarian readers on how to survive after a thermonuclear bomb blast, they were to stockpile weapons and seek a survivalist refuge in the hinterlands of America be it a remote commune in Oregon that is fleeing the apocalypse or a sandbagged family fortress where the kids pack 45 caliber automatics. When the neighbors broke into your garden to take your produce, you could ward them off with lethal violence. Book Chin turned Hess down, he wouldn't even want to survive a thermonuclear war, he said, and even if he somehow did, far from driving his neighbors away he would share whatever he had with them. He was an anarchist communist, 
not an individualistic libertarian. Least of all would he try to survive at the expense of others, what would be the point? He turned Hess down. So did the two old friends part ways. Far more to Bookchin's liking, the peace movement in Europe, opposing NATO's Euro missiles, had rapidly achieved mass proportions. Nonviolent, symbolic actions were being carried out everywhere, it seemed, peace initiatives, die-ins, nuclear free zones. Hundreds of thousands of people demonstrated in Bonn. In Britain, Women for Life on Earth, the group that had originated with Inistra King and her colleagues, established a peace camp outside the U.S. air base at Greenham Common, with protesters linking arms in human chains. In March 1982 Vermonters assembled in their town meetings to consider their local school budgets and road repairs, but this year many of them considered a national policy question as well, should the United States and the USSR freeze the testing, production and deployment of nuclear weapons and delivery systems? Activists throughout the state had put the question on as many town meeting agendas as they could. By day's end, a total of 177 towns endorsed the so-called nuclear freeze. Those endorsements, from a majority of Vermont towns, catapulted the freeze to a national issue. Organizers seized the momentum and went to work over the next months to plan a demonstration in New York. On June 12, almost a million people marched through the streets of Manhattan to demand a nuclear freeze, it was the largest political demonstration to date in American history. To Book Chin, the episode proved that ideas and actions originating on the margins, in Vermont, could have an impact on the country's political and financial centers. And beyond that, it proved that citizens in assemblies could have enormous ethical power, even to the point of challenging U.S. foreign policy. Book Chin continued his weekly commute between Burlington and Ramapo, but with West Germany bursting at its seams to protest the missiles, and with the freeze movement on the rise how could he remain in the ivory tower? He genuinely loved teaching, and Ramapo had treated him well. But his radical pedagogy was not producing social revolutionaries. Increasingly his students were concerned with building careers. He longed to put academia behind him, it was clearly no place for someone who wanted to change the world. The academic Marxists, with their pedantic articles, published in obscure journals, seemed ever more disconnected from actual political movements. Even the Frankfurt School writings were becoming something of an academic industry. To Bookchin's mind, Horkheimer and Adorno's most important contribution had been their exciting concerns with the domination of nature and their attempt to develop an alternative to the rationalization of the world, but their professorial heirs, rather than take up that crucial problem, retreated into the bloodless tenets of semiology and generated a mountain of writings laden with intellectual obscurantism. Yet the promising new peace, ecology and feminist movements desperately needed thinkers, a revolutionary intelligentsia that was at home in the streets as well as on the printed page. Today's academic intellectuals, Bookchin thought, should stop flinging rarefied quasi-Marxist jargon at each other in scholarly treatises, put an end to their lengthy refrigeration in the academy, and step out into the public realm, to help clarify movement issues and dilemmas, to raise awareness, to write with passion, and to speak truth to power. On April 16-18, 1982, the journal Telos invited Book Chin to participate in a conference at Carbondale, Illinois, where leftist academics would consider the issue of ecology and the welfare state. At the first session, as the professors were discussing the logic of the welfare state and something called deconstructionist ecology book chin lost patience. He leaped to his feet and began scolding the panelists and listeners alike. The peace, ecology, and anti-nuclear movements are out in the streets, he said. Why aren't you out there with them, helping those vibrant, genuinely radical movements, instead of walling yourselves off here with your opaque language? Paul Picone editor of Telos, retorted that the movements Book Chin praised were susceptible to nationalism, crude self-interest, the defense of existing privileges, and integration within the existing logic of domination. Radical consciousness, he explained, must undergo a whole series of more modest and realistic political mediations. 
people like Bookchin should refrain from self-righteous moralizing and instead spell out concrete proposals designed to shift the welfare state toward the reconstruction of a public sphere. Bookchin shot back that social movements had a social vision that goes beyond the logic of the welfare state. The clash escalated, until finally he snapped, this is the kind of academic environment that I am getting out of. Someone later observed that his truculent charisma and explosive rhetoric were undoubtedly the high point of the conference. But no love was lost between Bookchin and the academic world, their divorce would be uncontested. Wayne Hayes would miss stopping by the brass rail in Hoboken with Bookchin after work for Boilermakers, but he understood that his friend needed to leave Ramapo. The college had created a business school, and in the age of Reagan, it was quite popular, so much so that the environmental studies school was closed down. Ramapo, said Hayes, was becoming more routinized and regimented, more outcomes assessment oriented. More instrumental, Bookchin might have added. In March 1982 he announced that he would take early retirement. Two weeks after his 62nd birthday, on February 1, 1983, he retired to emeritus status. Now he could live fully on the margins, where the action was. In Burlington, he hit the ground running. In several impassioned essays he warned of looming ecological destruction and possible thermonuclear war. Ours, he said, might be the last generation that can still avert the virtual destruction of humanity and the complex biosphere upon which it depends. Burlington itself had no town meeting, chartered as a city it was governed by a city council known as the Board of Aldermen. Bookchin's goal was to create citizens' assemblies, like small town meetings, in each of the city's six wards, as outlined in On Neighborhood Democracy written for the 1981 Conference of Neighborhoods. The city's mushrooming neighborhood movement and its new socialist mayor made the prospects for creating those assemblies promising. In fact, if Bookchin could inspire citizens in town meetings statewide to broaden their agendas to address the ecological crisis, then they could potentially spark a nationwide movement for assembly democracy that could challenge the social order. The nuclear freeze issue had demonstrated that Vermont towns could have an impact on the whole country. As it happened, the Sanders administration expressed an interest in democratizing the city. In June 1981 Burlington was designated a standard metropolitan statistical area, which meant that it was eligible to receive federal block grants for community development projects, CDBGs. So Sanders's staff were busy developing proposals and applying for grants. One requirement was to show that citizens had participated in formulating the proposals through a democratic process. In the fall of 1981, perhaps inspired by the On Neighborhood Democracy Resolution, the Sanders administration proposed the creation of Neighborhood Planning Assemblies, NPAs, one in each of the city's six wards. In September 1982 the Board of Aldermen passed an enabling resolution, mandating that an NPA be organized in every ward. All voters in a particular ward of the NPA shall become voting members, said the resolution. Mayor Sanders told a reporter, we are attempting to do something that has not been done in many communities across the country and that is to involve large numbers of people in day-to-day -day affairs of government. The NPAs were not town meetings, vested with decision-making power, they were merely assemblies of citizens to comment and advise the city government, to make recommendations with respect to government decisions. Their one concrete power was to elect representatives to a committee to screen projects for CDBG funding. Still thought Bookchin, they were a good start, and a pro-democracy movement could push to endow them with ever greater authority. The city convened the initial meeting for each NPA, and at Bookchin's urging, the local social ecologists attended. We thought that these neighborhood meetings were great, Toker recalled, but rather than meet just when there's a block grant process, managed by City Hall, they should become neighborhood assemblies as ongoing entities with decision-making power. Burlington was also discussing how much growth to allow within its borders. Murray, fresh from New Jersey warned in June 1983 that while growth would generate jobs, profits, and tax revenues, it would also create pollution, shoddy goods, deadening work, congestion, and citizen passivity. 
the wrong kind of growth would transform Burlington from a convivial, neighborly community into a crass shopping mall. To avoid this fate, it should foster community-oriented, creative enterprises and technologies, in a clean, healthy environment. He and a dozen or so local social ecologists organized the Burlington Environmental Alliance, BEA, to make the city a beacon of forward-looking ecological self-management. One of the more sensitive areas of Burlington's environment is a bottomland along the Winooski River called the Intervale. For several years the city had been planning to construct a power plant there that would generate electricity by burning wood chips. When the project was initially proposed in 1977, it had garnered praise as a bold step toward energy self-sufficiency. But implementation had been delayed, and now in 1983 the State Public Service Board was holding hearings on whether to authorize it. BEA mobilized to oppose the 52-megawatt plant, which would burn some 500,000 to 800,000 tons of wood chips each year. Not only would the project harm Vermont forests, they argued, but the noise air pollution, and truck traffic would damage the Intervale's complex ecosystem. BEA created a poster caption the wood chip plant is coming, showing a landscape of tree stumps, and plastered it all over town. BEA was certain that Mayor Sanders would join them in opposing the plant, but in September, Sanders came out in favor of it. The anarchists who had just voted for him were stunned. Said Alan Kurtz, I feel ripped off. Then on September 14, after almost a year of hearings, the State Public Service Board approved the plant. The wood chips were coming after all. The socialist mayor was behaving strangely about the waterfront, too. Instead of calling public hearings on its future, as he'd promised during his campaign, Sanders created a task force to study the question and design an alternative vision that would reflect the character of our city. The task force turned the issue over to an architect, who proceeded to design a new plan, this one with a 22-story condo, a marina, and a hotel complex with shops. Bookchin and the social ecologists were a guest. This was no alternative at all, it was actually worse than the old Pomerlo plan. Even more astonishing, Sanders was actually meeting with Antonio Pomerlo, who said he was ready to invest $30 million in the redesigned project. Yes, the waterfront project would bring revenue to the city's coffers, in the form of property tax. But that wasn't the point, Burlington wasn't supposed to be for sale. In spite of his Robin Hood rhetoric, the local alt-weekly editorialized in late 1981, Bernie Sanders quietly developed a rapport with the city's richest developer. Opponents of the new design pointed out that it would severely limit public access to the waterfront. They managed to get a non-binding referendum on the ballot that called for a 30-foot public strip along the shore. The citizens of Burlington voted in favor of it. In November 1982 Pomerlow announced that he was pulling out of the project because of all the controversy and delays. Curiously, once the phase were up and running, Mayor Sanders stopped talking much about democracy. Asked on a local talk show whether he favored town meeting government in Burlington, he said it wasn't needed. The mayor seemed to be coming to the conclusion that he himself should have more power. Alarm bells went off in Bookchin's mind, why should Burlington want to centralize power in the mayor's office, he wondered, when the bays were now in place, and Burlington was on the brink of being able to demonstrate to the world how to democratically empower urban neighborhoods. But something peculiar was going on. In the democratic assemblies that Bookchin had in mind, citizens would be the ones to set the meeting's agendas, but for NPA meetings, city officials were setting the agendas, packing them up in advance with their own issues. The discussions that Bookchin had envisioned would take as long as they had to, so that everyone's voice would be heard, but for NPA meetings, city officials nailed the agenda items to strict time allotments, then breezed through them and adjourned punctually. Where was the bottom-up power flow so basic to assembly democracy? Bookchin was wondering by mid-1983. Where were civic vitality communal liberty and unmediated self-rule? When will we begin to take these assemblies seriously? The city council's enabling resolution had specified that at the second round of NPA meetings, 
the assemblies were to elect their own officers and draw up their own bylaws. But inexplicably those items, so crucial to democracy never made it to the agendas. Instead, the city planning department drew up its own set of bylaws and procedures and imposed them on the NPAs. It reduced the frequency of NPA meetings to only four a year. It then submitted these procedures to the city council for approval. When the council met to consider the new procedures Book Chin took the microphone during the period for public input. Crucial points of their enabling resolution were being overridden, he advised the councillors. It was their duty to correct this usurpation of power and ensure that the assemblies chose their own officers and bylaws, as originally specified. But the city council took no such action, and as time passed, the NPAs remained as they were, mere extensions, in Bookchin's eyes, of the city government rather than vehicles for neighborhood self-rule. Some were well attended, and others were not, but by no means did any of them become town meetings. Indeed, as these assemblies increasingly disagreed with Sanders' administration, said another observer in 1986, they became less favored, and their voice has been diffused by providing minimal staffing that is always hired by and responsible to the administration, not the assemblies. Meanwhile, Burlington's lively neighborhood movement had quieted down. The election of the socialist mayor had co-opted a lot of its energy, as Toker recalled. Organizers who had worked for neighborhood organizations all went to work for City Hall. Where political life in Burlington had only recently been creative and fluid, it was now being siphoned into municipal office holding, careerism, as it seemed to book chin. Traditionally, Vermont's political culture was wary of professionalism. The state legislature met for only half the year. The legislators drew no salaries and had no offices, only a small proportion of them were lawyers, and they had to go before the voters every two years. Most other states' office holders had four-year terms, but in Vermont the governor, the legislators, and all the rest had and still have only two-year terms. The provision was inconvenient for career politicians, but in practice it allowed Vermonters to frequently review the performance of their public officials and hold them accountable. In January 1983 the Senate Operations Committee proposed to amend the state constitution to replace the two-year term with a four-year term. The change would modernize Vermont, the committee said, and make it more efficient, like the other states. But Book Chin thought that extending terms to four years would wreck the state's uniquely democratic culture. It would professionalize state house politicians and foster New Jersey, style bureaucracy and centralization, complete with high-priced lobbyists. With the proposed four-year term, Vermont's style of local democracy was at stake. He organized a group to defend the two-year term, called the Vermont Council for Democracy. He recruited, among others, town meeting expert Frank Bryan, right-wing libertarian John McClaffrey, peace activists Robin Lloyd and David Dellinger, and leftist journalist Greg Guma. The VCD issued a poster showing a crown with a slash through it. The integrity of the citizens' commonwealth was far more valuable than efficiency and professionalism, especially as defined by other, less democratic states. Throughout 1983, in a flurry of interviews, articles, and flyers, Book Chin campaigned to save the two-year term. The sitting governor, Madeleine Cunin, defended the four-year term proposal, arguing that the cost of campaigning and the length of campaigns make the two-year term really difficult. Murray responded that office holders' best campaign tool should be their record in office, and that the two-year term was Vermont's mechanism for keeping statewide politicians accountable. In November 1982 the Burlington Free Press came out in support of the four-year term. After Book Chin saw it, he charged into the office of Dan Costello, editorial page editor, told him why he was wrong, and actually persuaded him to change his mind. The Free Press editorial board now has exercised its prerogative of reversing its position on the issue, Costello editorialized soon thereafter. Vermont has had fine governors, and none has seemed to be hampered by the two-year term. The existing system has served the state well, so there appears to be little reason for changing it. The Vermont Council's campaign even succeeded in changing the mind of Senator Bill Doyle, 
the proposal's prime mover in the state Senate. Now he agreed with Bookchin that the four-year term would professionalize government and said his committee would review the proposal. That was the end of it. The fate of Burlington's 24-acre waterfront was still up in the air. After developer Palmer Lowe opted out of the redesigned project, a group of wealthy local investors had begun buying up parcels. They called themselves Alden Corporation but kept their identity secret. In March 1983 they began devising a new plan to develop the lake shore. In April the citizens of Burlington were invited to attend their respective NPA meetings to consult on the future of the waterfront. It was the closest the city had yet come to soliciting public input, as Sanders had promised. But as the citizens gathered at the meetings, they found themselves sitting through a slideshow in which the Alden promoters presented their vision, which turned out to be extremely vague. Discussion afterward was minimal and tightly managed. The promoters then distributed a questionnaire, asking the citizens what they wanted to see on the waterfront. The citizens duly filled out the questionnaire saying they wanted a marina, a fishing pier, a ferry, a restaurant, and a park, and that they did not want hotels, motels, or condos. They wanted public access to the lake, any new buildings should be set back from the shore by even more than the 30 feet now required. In June 1983 Alden hired a prominent Boston architect to incorporate the citizens' recommendations into a plan. While the architect worked, citizens discussed among themselves. In December 1983 Bookchin's BEA group sponsored a workshop in which participants developed an ecotopian plan for the waterfront, with a park, marinas, and natural areas. The Citizens' Waterfront Group, CWG, called for an 80-foot-wide waterfront park for walking, jogging, and bicycling. In late January 1984, to a packed house at City Hall, the Alden Group unveiled their preliminary plan, in another slideshow, this time accompanied by music. It showed some traces of the much-vaunted citizen input, a bike path and public access. But the $100 million plan was enormous in scale dwarfing the plan that Sanders had run against in 1981. It featured a three- to five-story lakeside hotel, with 150 to 200 rooms, two seven- or eight-story luxury condo towers, 150,000 square feet of office space, a pedestrian boardwalk, a retail pavilion, a waterfront heritage center, to memorialize the beautiful stretch that the plan was despoiling, a marina, parking space, and a small park. At the public meeting, criticism was immediate and vociferous. The plan didn't provide enough parkland along the shore, the buildings were too densely packed and too close to the water, the design was like Epcot, the presentation was a sales pitch. In February the various opposition groups joined forces to form the Waterfront Coalition. Meanwhile, a local attorney and Alden opponent, Rick Sharp, had been doing some research. In 1892 the U.S. Supreme Court had issued the Public Trust Doctrine, according to which all landfill in a state was the inalienable property of the people of that state and must be used in the public interest. And the waterfront was indeed landfill, in the 19th century the state legislature had permitted the Central Vermont Railway to fill in the first 400 feet along the shore. The railroad was permitted to use the filled-in land as an expanded rail yard, once that specific use was over, the land was to revert to public use. Burlington's waterfront therefore belonged to the people of Vermont, and they were the only ones with the legal power to decide its fate. Opponents of luxury waterfront condos now had legal muscle to flex. In the spring of 1983, the European peace movement reached its peak of intensity. In Britain 80,000 campaigners linked arms in a spectacular 14-mile human chain spanning three key defense installations, from Greenham Common to Aldermaston. In West Germany thousands of demonstrators blocked entrances to six U.S. military bases. In Burlington, a painful fact came to light, the progressive-minded city with the socialist mayor was home to an important munitions producer. A general electric plant in the south end of town happened to be the world's most significant manufacturer of the Gatling gun, a high-speed antipersonnel weapon whose seven rotating barrels could fire up to 4,200 rounds per minute. 
It was currently being used on helicopter gunships in the civil war in El Salvador, deployed against the communist FMLN. On June 18 several hundred activists protested in front of the GE plant, demanding that it convert to peaceful production. The five-hour rally featured speeches by longtime activists David Dellinger and Grace Paley. Two days later several dozen protesters blockaded truck traffic as it was leaving the plant. Police arrested 88 of them on charges of disorderly conduct and took them to the police station, where they were fingerprinted and photographed, then released. 29 returned to block the gate again, Bookchin drove to the police station to pick us up and take us back to the plant gate, recalled one of the blockaders. It was a great day. Bookchin's only criticism was that the protest's focus was too narrow. As in Clamshell, he wanted the peace movement to broaden itself to oppose hierarchy in general and to support feminism and ecology and democracy and community, as the huge, multi-issue peace movement in Europe was doing. But surprisingly Mayor Sanders, who had often solidarized with the left against U.S. intervention in Central America, refused to endorse the protest. The GE plant was the second largest employer in the state, he said. Those workers made a decent living and had a right to their jobs. The protesters were pointing the finger of guilt at working people but not everybody has the luxury of choosing where they are going to work. Sanders even endorsed the arrests of the demonstrators. Jaws dropped all over Burlington. Overall, the socialist mayor's track record was showing an unmistakable shift to the right. He had supported the wood chip plant in the Intervale and luxury condos on the waterfront. His administration had vitiated the NPAs. Now he supported high-powered arms production, on behalf of the factory workers. In a pamphlet called Workers and the Peace Movement, Bookchin reprised arguments from Listen, Marxist, and contended that people who work in factories are not to be reduced to workers, they are concerned, like everyone else about nuclear catastrophe, about peace, about environmental destruction, and about their children's future, their human locus is the community in which they live, not the factory in which they work. Radical movements should address them not as proletarians but as community members, as neighbors. The color of radicalism today is no longer red, he wrote. It is green, the politics we must pursue is grassroots, fertilized by the ecological, feminist, communitarian, and anti-war movements. Still, Marxist reverence for the proletariat continued to have a strong grip on the minds of American leftists, not least in Burlington. In 1979 in Nicaragua, the Sandinista National Liberation Front, a coalition of left-wing revolutionary forces that included Marxists, had overthrown a dynastic regime in a bloody revolution. Once in power, the Sandinistas restructured agriculture, redistributed land to the peasantry and instituted a laudable literacy program, their revolution was welcomed and applauded by the international left. Their government soon came under attack by reactionary forces, however, as the American President Reagan first tried to isolate and destabilize the regime, then organized and funded the Contras to overthrow it. During the war that continued for the rest of the 1980s, Burlington's progressives identified strongly with the FSLN, to the point of earning for themselves the nickname Sanderistas. Bookchin, however, was exasperated that once again he had to explain the problems with that ideology that he had been contesting for decades. It came as no surprise to him that the Sandinistas brutalized Nicaragua's Mosquito Indians, burning villages and forcing them to leave their homelands. Led by Brooklyn Rivera, the Mosquitos Mijerezada movement took up arms against the Sandinistas, without allying with the Contras, they were a third force. Bookchin, together with his friend the Seneca John Mohawk, solidarized with the Mosquitos and sharply attacked the Sandinistas. Leftists, notably the Marxist Joel Kavel, took umbrage and charged Bookchin with de facto allying with the Contras. He denied it, my enemy's enemy is not my friend, as I heard him say, around this time, on a radio broadcast over WBAI-FM in New York. Bookchin could sometimes work effectively as an organizer, as he did on this action. He took pride in his ability to polemicize, seeing a clear, 
consistent argument as essential for clarifying ideas. Usually I found his polemical salvos instructive, recalled Howie Hawkins, who knew him from clamshell days. He believed that the clash of ideas would sharpen our understanding. Such clarifications were indeed necessary, there were plenty of would-be lefties, Hawkins notes, who deserved a withering critique and an audience of young would-be radicals that desperately needed to be educated on the differences between a liberal accommodation to an oppressive, irrational, and destructive society and a radical approach to social freedom and ecological rationality. But especially in the heat of argument, when Book Chin felt something important was at stake, his delivery could become harsh, peremptory, and dismissive, and his polemical rigor could slip over into scalding acrimony. To take just one example Dmitry Rousseau-Polos recalled Bookchin's speech to an audience in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in the late 1970s. He was in fine form, Rousseau-Polos said, the turnout was good, and the audience was enthralled by his oratory. But there was one Trotskyist, who asked him something about Kronstadt, the 1921 Sailors' Revolt of 1921, this audience member defended Trotsky's role in suppressing it. Out comes the ideological Sherman tank, recalled Rousseau-Polos, and Bookchin just rolled over that poor person who dared to take the mic. Nothing but bones were left afterward. Murray's point was correct, Trotsky's brutality was indefensible, and furthermore, given the international left's difficulty, over generations, in weaning itself from Marxism, his interventions on that score were generally salutary. But the way he did it, says Rousseau-Polos, of that typical episode, changed the mood of the audience. Similarly, in the 1980s, when Bookchin criticized Mayor Sanders for compromising with developers, his point was well taken, but his tone was so harsh that it alienated those who might otherwise have sympathized with his view. When the mayor's supporters rose to defend him, Bookchin slammed them vituperatively. He called activist Marty Jezer's defense of Sanders a Lyndon LaRouche dossier and repellent demagoguery. It was way over the top, I wince to read those words today. Similarly, in these years young idealists would be attracted to Bookchin's writings, inspired by his utopian vision, and moved to Burlington to work with him, only to be put off by his spleen. Suzanne Stritzler, a one-time BEA member, noticed that it happened repeatedly forming a pattern. People would arrive in the city with excitement in their eyes, then gradually the glow would dim, and a few months later they'd slip away. Greg Guma, an erstwhile Burlington collaborator, finally concluded that Bookchin spent too much time denouncing those whose approach, or occasional tactics, didn't conform to his social ecological theory and vision. Murray had trouble disagreeing without splitting. Buchan's usual response to such criticism was to dismiss it, saying that he didn't care how he came across. If someone listened to him only for his tone, he said, then it was their problem that they missed the content. But people tend to remember tone at least as much as content, and if the tone of an argument is disproportionate to the content, it can undermine even an otherwise solid case. Debate as Book Chin often pointed out, is healthy and intellectually stimulating, but at times he seemed to forget that venom and gall, as Weber had called it, can be self-defeating, leading to ineffectiveness and political isolation. The personality issue got in the way of him being able to practice his politics, said Rousseau-Polos. Carl Ludwig Skibel agreed that Buchin's vitriolic attacks on his colleagues were the main reason why he was not and still today is not adequately received in the intellectual discourse. What was the reason for the harshness? I think it stems from his sense of urgency about building a sophisticated radical movement to address the looming ecological crisis. To that end, he placed an unusually high value on ideas, on theoretical rigor, on a movement's ideological underpinnings. He had grown up in an era of competing ideologies, and more than his younger friends, he continued to believe that theory and ideas were an essential basis for movement building. Only by continually clarifying a movement's aims and its means could it ultimately be kept from selling out or producing harmful unintended consequences, as had happened too often with past leftist movements.
Those who advocated misleading or hybridized or compromising ideas in a movement threatened that movement's promise. I think the issue dates back as well to the YCL, when the older commissars had placed such heavy, excessive responsibility on the YCLERS shoulders at an early age, they had essentially taught Book Chin and his comrades, during the ultra-revolutionary third period, that they were responsible for saving civilization. Such responsibility would be overwhelming for an adult to bear, let alone a child. Now in 1983, when he would see a dubious tendency gaining ground, he spoke out against it urgently, as if the fate of the revolution depended on getting his point across. In any case Buchin's polemical harshness was the flip side of his great personal open-heartedness, which was his normal demeanor with those in direct contact with him and who worked closely with him. They found him emotionally and intellectually generous, sharing even his most original ideas, spending countless hours talking to near strangers, trying to cultivate them as he had done ever since his mentorship of Alan Hoffman. Guileless, unfiltered, he wore his heart on his sleeve and was surprised when others did not. He had no vanity no interest in personal glory or financial gain. He was the opposite of instrumental. He was eager to the point of insistence to teach and inspire, because achieving socialism rather than barbarism, ecology rather than catastrophe, depended on it. He once remarked that some people have to push too hard, so that others would push hard enough. I'll let that be the last word. After the Institute for Social Ecology lost Kate Farm, the school might well have gone under. But the director, Dan Choderkoff, held it together organizationally and found ways for it to continue. In 1982 the ISE organized a second urban alternatives conference at El Bohio in Lois Aida, it brought together 300 activists, representing 60 community and environmental groups, from Green Gorillas to Acorn, who talked about neighborhood economic development, community self-management, and energy and food production. Faculty members were finding ways to put social ecology into practice. In 1981 instructor Joseph Kiefer initiated a hunger education and food garden program in Montpelier. Many of us find it hard to believe, he observed, that hunger exists in our own communities. The program taught basic food gardening skills to low-income children. The produce they grew was donated to a food bank that redistributed it to food shelves, daycare centers, and senior citizens. Starting in 1983, after a two-year hiatus, the ISE resumed its summer sessions, renting space on secondary school campuses around Vermont. Enrollment was only around 40, less than half of the norm in Kate Farms' heyday, and the session lasted one month instead of three. But Book Chin still lectured each day for three hours at a clip on social ecology. In the summer of 1984, the school rented quarters at a school in Vershire. As farm animals grazed on the lawn through the picture window in the background, recounted a journalist, social theorist Murray Book Chin slowly rocked back and forth in his chair, delivering a two hour lecture on cultural anthropology, while students clustered around him eagerly jotting notes. In the late 1970s, when he was drawing a professor's salary Bookchin had purchased a piece of land near Goddard, intending to build a house there. But after the loss of Kate Farm, he sold the land and in November 1982 used the proceeds to help his ex-wife turned friend Beatrice purchase a home in Burlington's South End. He moved into this yellow-painted house renting a room on the second floor that he used both as a study and as sleeping quarters. The retired professor was eager to keep teaching, to build the democracy movement, so the Yellow House's living room became an informal classroom. In 1983-84 he also taught a course on radical social theory and revolutionary history at Burlington College, a small alternative school. But mostly he wrote, in a geyser of literary production. At Ramapo, formal teaching commitments had kept him from his typewriter, now it all came pouring out, intensified by renewed political purpose. First he set down the historical underpinnings for his movement for municipal democracy. The city's emergence in ancient times had been a historic advance over tribalism, he wrote, allowing people to associate with one another based not on biological kinship but on residential propinquity. 
strangers could find a home, intermix, form ties with their neighbors. Common humanity could transcend tribe. He fell in love intellectually with the civic sphere, where all strangers were potentially equals, and with the idea of citizenship as an ethical compact. Moreover, at least since medieval times, the municipality had been a historic counter-tendency to centralized authority. The medieval communes of northern Italy had joined together to form the Lombard League, pitted against the Holy Roman Empire. In 1520-22 the cities of Castile had revolted against the royal authority of Carlos V. These communero rebels had formed neighborhood assemblies that enfranchised even the lowest ranks of the community. The communero cities had formed a confederation of municipalities that teetered on being a dramatic alternative to the nation-state. In modern times, almost every major revolution has involved indeed, has often been, a conflict between the local community and the centralized state. The Paris Commune of 1871 had been municipal both in location and in spirit, but so, in significant ways, had the American Revolution of the 1770s, initially driven by the Boston Town Meeting, and the French Revolution, energized in some stages by the Parisian sectional assemblies. The Russian and Spanish revolutions had been carried out by peasants newly arrived in urban factories who found one another concentrated in the city and shared their resentments of the unremitting pace of industrial capitalism. Accustomed to the seasonal rhythms of the countryside, they refused to cooperate with its mechanistic rigors, hence Petersburg in 1917, hence Barcelona in 1936. The more I look into the great revolutionary movements that opened the modern era, he wrote, the more they seemed to have been by nature urban. They had been based in specific neighborhoods in Paris, Petrograd, and Barcelona, and in small towns and villages, where people took action not only as economic beings but as communal beings. Today, he argued, the potential for social freedom still reposes in the municipality. To be sure, existing municipal governments, with their city managers, mayors, and councils, are states in miniature, but popular democratic struggle could rework them, transform them into citizens' assemblies. In Buchan's eyes, the democratized municipality and the municipal confederation as an alternative to the nation-state, was the last, best redoubt for socialism. He presented these ideas and arguments, which he called libertarian municipalism, in their fullest form in the rise of urbanization and the decline of citizenship, published in 1986. In other works he explained in practical terms how to undertake this municipal revolutionary process. Interested individuals should form groups to study the history and politics of assembly democracy and especially to unearth the long-forgotten democratic traditions in their own locality. Those long-forgotten institutions can be unearthed and brought to new life. After all, the commune still lies buried in the city council, the Parisian sections still lie buried in the neighborhood, the town meeting still lies buried in the township. Once the study group members have educated themselves, they can become a political group and enter the public sphere. They can run candidates for the city council, on a program calling for the creation of popular assemblies. When and if those candidates are elected to office, they pass enabling resolutions or use other means to change their municipal charter, to devolve power from the council to the citizens' assemblies. They gain power precisely in order to renounce it. The assemblies, once created, municipalize local economic life, producing for use rather than for profit. They institute small-scale manufacturing and renewable energy facilities. They decentralize the city and build green spaces and urban gardens. They make the automobile redundant by improving public transportation. They create an ethical society as the free municipality transforms an ecological ethics from the realm of precept into the realm of politics. To handle common problems over larger regions, the democratized municipalities elect delegates, mandated, recallable, to coordinating councils, whose functions are purely administrative, executing policy rather than making it. The confederated municipalities act as a break on centralized state power and ultimately replace it. Will the confrontation be violent? Or will the confederation erode the state machinery gradually? 
Book Chin left the question open. For now, he condensed his program into a slogan, democratize the republic and radicalize the democracy.